Morning, everybody. Um, okay. Um, my, my talk will give a slightly complementary um, viewpoint to what we just heard from Tim. Um, I've, I'm just celebrating my 30th year in industry. Uh, September 86, I joined BBC Research Department as a graduate trainee, and since then I've had possibly 10 or 12 different jobs, and I've flitted around the industry a fair bit, and I've got to that stage in my career where I've seen most things, and I'm now starting to recruit junior engineers to join um, development teams. Now, back in when I went through the system in the mid-80s, um, there was a very strong distinction between hardware engineers and software engineers, and I took the hardware path, um, and as such, I am not really a strong coder. Um, uh, those who chose to specialize in software have gone on to great things, but at that time, there was a division between the disciplines that you, you, you chose path A or path B. And, and now, what I see amongst young people is that they have to be multidisciplinary. So, the requirement for what young engineers can do has changed considerably over the years. So anyway, I'm gonna crack on through the first few slides. Um, some of it is, is um, open for question. I'm, I'm going to make a few statements and I'd like you to perhaps think about what has been said and um, perhaps question some of it. So what I will say is, is education fundamentally the ultimate in open processes? Um, it might be free to use up to a certain level. Uh, teaching materials are widely available. Um, you can use them, you can update them, you can enhance them, you can reissue them. It is an altruistic process that's really done to improve the wider interests of society. And these days, there's just so much material out there on the net that students have opportunity to engage in tutorial materials that when I went through the system, the, it was impossible to get the information that you needed. Data sheets took three days in the post to arrive, and when they did, your, your design ideas had moved on. So, so um, the, the good thing is that if you want to know about something these days, you get online, and somebody out there has done it. And if you're trying to get started with a new microcontroller, and you want to know how to set up the SPI ports or whatever, Somewhere out there, somewhere on the planet, somebody will have written that bit of code and you cut and paste and you say, ah, so that's how you do it. So there's still people out there reading the data sheet and doing, doing this stuff for the first time. So <clears throat> what's new in 35 years? Well, we've seen the advent of massive online courses. Um, guerrilla, guerrilla learning, this is all that sort of grey market educational material that people are putting on tutorials and Hackaday and Instructables and there's a wealth of material on how just to do things out there and it's not come from through the, the traditional educational routes. Um, we've got open software and open hardware movements that um, certainly open hardware, that's only something that's come together in the last, uh, well, it's less than 10 years. We've got new platforms. There's just about every month there's some new Linux widget or an IoT thing that's, that's interesting. You know, if you troll Kickstarter, you see that someone's managed to get a mobile phone chip onto a thing about the size of your thumbnail and they're selling it for somewhere between five and nine dollars, you know. so. We live in massively exciting times in terms of what's becoming available. It's relentless. And how do you keep up with the, with the technical change? Also, um, compared to when I went through the system or when I was born in 1965, the, the world had 
half the population that it has now. And there are hundreds of millions of people entering the education system every October. And they will all have their learning experience and they'll come out three or four years later and they will want to find gainful employment. And, you know, um, we, we have to find ways of preparing that bright new talent for the world that's ahead of them. And I came out in 86 when we still needed grunt engineers to work in the, uh, the defense industry. But I didn't want to follow that route. I went and joined the BBC and, you know, I, 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 I didn't want to just become some guy in a cubicle um, plodding away at some weapon system. So times are changing. So how do we prepare all that new talent for the digital revolution? OK, so what's good? Well, a larger percentage of students can now access tertiary education and get their first degree. There's a lot more choice. Based on the American system, you can now pick and mix your course content, and you can do a module of this and a module of that, whereas we, as I recall, it was just dictated. You will do this, and maybe in your final year, you might get a couple of options, but there was none of this, so I'll start this course, and I'll get some credits on that, and I'll change and do that. And so there is a huge amount of choice. Um, I said earlier, information has never been so easy to access. Um, you, you, can, you can guess it on your laptop, you can guess it on your tablet, on your smartphone. It, it's just so easy. And also, um, undergraduates are traveling around the world to, to take part in this global revolution of education. They want to, particularly from Southeast Asia, they want to come to the Western countries and for a cultural and an academic education. And the knock-on effect of all these millennials coming and, and, and traveling to the West and getting what's effectively a Western education, the, the knock-on effect to their, their society within the next 5, 10, 15 years is, is going to be enormous. What's not good? Well, massive increase in costs. I went through the system free of charge. Um, I marched over Westminster Bridge and was set upon by police horses in November of 84 when we were fighting to, to retain the student grant. How times have changed. I don't want to be 21 years old and 40-something thousand pounds in debt. We never had that burden put on us. Dilution of standards. I, I interviewed many new graduates of electronic engineering who just can't use Ohm's law. What are they teaching them out there? Um, so, you know, the education system has to get aligned with the, the, the needs of industry. Sadly, um, you, you, you graduate, you've got your certificate, but that doesn't always mean that you're going to go straight into a fulfilling career. Um, the graduate trainee schemes that so many of us embarked upon for 18 months when we, when we first graduated, where we were sent um, back to maybe a, a special um, training school, particularly at the BBC, we had Wood Norton, where they taught us how to work TV cameras and um, work radio studios and men transmitters and all sorts of things. Those schemes have been eroded away to the point that they're no longer there. Oops, sorry, I missed one. Um, right, massive online uh, courses. Um, one of these that I came across uh, a couple of years ago is uh, From Nan to Tetris. Uh, how many of you have encountered this? Right, okay. I suggest you Google it. Um, it has to be the poster child of online learning. Um, Shimon Shokin and his co-author, uh, Noam Nissan, 10 years ago, they put together a book to try and get engineering and computer science students a better overall picture of how computers work. So they started from first principles with the NAND gate, 
and chapter by chapter they took you through a series of layers of hardware so you actually designed and implemented your own 16-bit computer. Now, all of the materials to do that were PC-based um, and uh, there was a, a hardware description language and you could uh, build your own gates and simulate them and uh, you build up um, from simple uh, sequential and combinatorial logic, you'd build uh, shift registers and multiplexers and uh, arithmetic logic units and program counters. And after five chapters and um, maybe five days hard work, you, you'd got yourself the hardware designed for a very simple 16-bit processor. And I rattled through the, uh, the first five chapters of that book in a few evenings. And it's, when I put that thing together, and it's actually executed code, you have that aha moment. So that's how it works, you know. And then I hit a bit of a brick wall because the next seven chapters of the book were software, starting with machine language for, for that processor. And it was really back to school for me to, to get my head around some of the layers of software from the machine language to assembly language to compilers to uh, virtual machines um, to high level languages. This was a, a big hole in my education and I wouldn't have realized that unless I'd followed the Nanda Tetris course. So anyway, we can all go back to school at some time. So um, with online study, there's, there's a vast wealth of new academic material becoming available. Um, and the good thing about online material is you can pick and choose and you can dip into it as you want. You may be holding down a full-time job and you just need refreshed in certain techniques and you can, you've got the opportunity to, to mix your work and, and your study. And uh, we're likely to see a massive growth in this in the next 10 to 20 years. There's going to be a lot more of it. Okay, here's uh, Shimon Shokin's book. Uh, that, was, that was him aged five, and he's already got a primitive computing device there. Um, if you do the course, uh, I recommend that you buy the book. It's about 20 pounds, and it all goes to supporting this that I believe is a very worthy cause. Okay, how do we open this up? Well, open software and open hardware, they prevent uh, they present tremendous co commercial opportunities. Um, today's young people are no less motivated than we were when we were 16, 17, 18. Um, if you saw Amy's talk uh, yesterday evening at the festival, it was inspirational, you know. Um, uh, we, the elder generation often puts the young generation down saying, well, they're not interested, they're demotivated and all the rest of it, but they've got the same brains that we have, they've got, they've got new and different skills. They can, uh, they can, they can, they, they can type on uh, touch screens without even looking at it. And, and you know, um, they are going to go on and they're going to become the new generation of engineers and scientists. And um, so we have to find ways of, of uh, training those people so that they meet the, the needs of the, the, the new evolving uh, digital industrial revolution. Um, so there's a need for affordable products and platforms. Um, with any open technology, there's a, a strong community and sharing ethos. Um, these, these techniques are applicable both to the Western world and to the developing world. You know, and if, if we can find the right products at the low enough price. There's no reason why um, the, the, uh, this open education can't be a global phenomenon. It all helps to break down the geographical and cultural barriers. You know, um, I'm currently working with a young lad who, who lives in Shenzhen and, uh, you know, uh, he, he recently came to the UK. It was his first time ever out of China and we drove around the UK on a, on a tour of hack spaces at the end of June, and he couldn't believe how green the countryside was. He couldn't believe the number of cows, sheep, horses, and whatever in the fields. And, you know, um, he had only ever got his ideas of, of what the UK is like from, from what he'd seen on 
Chinese websites and actually traveling as so many young Chinese do to get a, uh, an education uh, in, in the UK and North America. That opens up their, their ideas to, um, to, to, to the Western ways in which things are done. And that can only be a good thing if, uh, if we're to have a better uh, exchange between, uh, between East and West. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, uh, the emphasis should be on learning by doing. I'm, I'm a very practical guy, and um, I've got certain skills that I picked up by watching and learning, and it was a young Chinese lad who was changing microprocessors on a circuit board in a Shenzhen factory who taught me how to take a uh, a microcontroller off a board using a, uh, a soldering iron with a, a, a massive uh, bit on it and, and how quickly he could change a micro, uh, get, get the old one off and get a new one on using very, very primitive tools. And once, you, once you've seen how uh, people use these skills and you're able to, to copy them, um, you know, it's, it's tremendous. And uh, finally, um, I think uh, young people ought to be able to demand more from their £9,000 or, if you're an overseas student, £16,000 per year. Okay, new platforms. Um, <coughs> yeah, uh, we've, we've, got, uh, we've got a mix of platforms and uh, the open software community is, uh, is, is coming up with packages that will run on, on uh, multi-platform. There's a, there's a whole wealth of single board computers like the Raspberry Pi, the BeagleBone Black that Tim mentioned. Uh, if you want something with a bit of grunt, there's the Odroid. And, and then there's uh, IoT devices like Omega 2 and all of these little um, wireless uh, connected devices. Um, basic engineering design tools, um, they should be opened up. Uh, they all share a sort of common graphics core and uh, maybe there should be a concerted effort to try and make the tools compatible with each other and, and make it simple. And it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in the east or west, there will be um, a set of design tools that have been tried and tested and, and made to work. Let's, let's get the tools that we need and make them accessible. So KiCAD is a start, but we need to follow that up in mechanical CAD. And we need to be able to to work uh, with systems that, that link neatly into laser cutting and CNCing and, and 3D printing. And um, we need to be able to access low-cost global manufacturers, such uh, in, in North America, you've got Oshpark for PCB manufacturer. Well, students ought to be able to design things and send the design files off, and a week later, they come back from Shenzhen. If they could do that, there'd be no stopping them. OK, here's Odroid. Um, I think the fan gives it away that it's, um, it, it's got quite a bit of grunt. All right, and um, sorry, a, a blatant plug of a new product of mine. Do you step up, sir? Pass that around the audience. Um, Alan's going to be talking about my storm later, so all I'm just going to say, it's a, it's a multi-headed beast and we're learning how to tame it. <laughs> it's uh, got a 32-bit arm and it's got a big FPGA and you can plug a, you can plug a Pi in on the, on the top connector. Okay, do it yourself. Um, imagine a, a, a situation where engineering and computer science students are issued with a very cheap bit of hardware in Freshers' Week, and it's theirs to keep and build upon. And basically, it was probably a, a, a Linux platform with, um, with some FPGA. And it allows personal experimentation that anywhere. You can do it in your study room. You don't have to have access to a lab in order to tinker with hardware. You learn by doing. Students could build their own instruments like multimeters, uh, digital oscilloscopes, logic analyzers, um, uh, protocol sniffers. These devices, they're, they're, they're not overly complex. And, and if you give them a, a platform that's got the processing power to do that, 
they can design their own, point them in the right direction, and um, have the means that any designs that they come up with can be quickly replicated and shared around the campus or shared around the world. So one possibility is that they build up their own tablets or laptop. Uh, for example, something on the lines of PyTop, which um, is, is uh, an open platform. It uses a Raspberry Pi. You put it together, and there's a big hole in the middle which allows you to put your own hardware for example, uh, uh, an experimental breadboard or whatever. So, you know, there are some innovative ideas out there and how we can come up with innovative products, you know, that, that make this so much easier and accessible. Okay, uh, five years ago, there was um, MyDAC, which is, uh, it's a kind of um, uh, data acquisition system. It's from National Instruments. It's 142 pounds. Um, the breadboard that goes with it is 58 pounds, so you've spent 200 pounds and you've got, what, 20 quid's worth of hardware? So that needs to be opened up. Um, right, new languages, um, C, C++, they provide a, a, a framework. Students should be encouraged to code. New languages are constantly out there, JavaScript, Python, Lua. And then hardware description languages like Verilog, VHDL, an open one, a uh, recent one called MyHDL, and one from uh, Nicholas Berth, the uh, Pascal pioneer, called Lola, logic language, I believe that's short for. Okay, new approach, teach a man to fish. Um, engineering students, they, they have a common first year where they're given practical um, uh, instruction in 3D printing and, and uh, laser cutting and soldering and coding and sort of stuff that hack spaces do. So they can all have fun and generally get them motivated. Uh, the introductory year gives them uh, access to basic mechanical and electronic engineering coding skills and those design tools that I spoke of earlier. Um, practical content, so every First year undergraduate can lay out the PCB or write an Arduino sketch or what, whatever. And then later in their career, an industrial placement year. I recently had a young lad join me from Vietnam, and he came to me as a very, very shy 20-year-old. I threw him in at the deep end. He, 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 in his first week, he uh, designed and laid out um, uh, an Arduino-based um, uh, processor boards, and uh, uh, then I taught him how to solder it, and it was all surface mount, and he, eight months later, he was laying out four-layer boards for me, so, and uh, his soldering skills, partially due to his, his acute eyesight, uh, were much better than mine are these days. Uh, how do you get it started? Well, uh, Shimon Shokin's uh, The Elements of Computing Design shows one successful approach, open platforms, I've mentioned uh, BeagleBone, Pocket Chip. Uh, there's more and more of them out there. Um, Low-cost hardware, uh, our very own uh, MyStorm. A collaborative effort to, to produce easily accessible and well-researched content. It's all very well having platforms, but platforms are useless without content. And then you need to build the strength of the community and the ecosystems around those platforms. Industrial placement, I think I covered this two minutes ago, um, but if you spend a year in industry, um, somewhere in the middle of your academic course, you learn to work with a team rather than perhaps individual study. It improves your communication skills. It gives you a sense of purpose uh, to reinforce your academic studies. It always looks good on your CV and uh, uh, my my uh, tutee, he went on to get a good job working for a satellite communication company in Hampshire, which uh, um, he was uh, delighted with. And it can be an enjoyable experience to both the student and the mentor. Okay, what can be achieved? Well, can we modify the university system to allow for a greater practical content in some way? An online network of affiliated course providers we need to get industry involved. They know what they need in terms of what skills graduates should have. 
Um, and maybe a sabbatical exchange, that's a two-way exchange program, so that industry and education, they can um, swap roles for maybe a year at a time to, to, to learn a bit more about each other's um, uh, environment and discipline. Okay, oops. With the right education, you can always stand out in a crowd. Uh, that's me. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.